welcome to The New Paradigm for Mankind, a weekly discussion between Lyndon LaRouche and his scientific associates in which we investigate the true nature of the creative human mind and the ideas necessary for the progress of mankind. Hello and welcome. This is the week of July 17th, 2013. My name is Creighton Jones, and joining us in the studio today are Jason Ross of our scientific research team and editor of 21st Century Science and Technology magazine, and of course, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Now, for those who have been following the website, you may be aware that we have a particular type of action underway now in our nation's capital where well, we've got what's known as our policy committee, which is made up of, uh, what do we have, six different members of that committee, many of them former candidates for Congress and other offices, who are now in the process of providing and injecting the necessary leadership into the political direction that we need to go. Um, among them are such candidates as Keisha Rogers, who people may remember as a young African-American woman, twice won her Democratic primary on a ticket for the impeachment of Barack Obama and the saving of NASA. I think a policy which is still very much needed today. And of course, uh, Rachel Brown, who gained initial notoriety as she took on Barty Frank in a public, a public forum, denouncing him for his support of what could be only classified as a Nazi health care policy, which we're now seeing that play out and gained a certain amount of national notoriety as this debate was picked up on uh, places like the Jon Stewart show. She then went on to really dismantle Barney Frank around the issue of Glass-Steagall during their congressional debate, where it became very clear that Barney Frank had neither an understanding of Glass-Steagall nor an intent to push any kind of policy that was in the interest of the population. And in fact, before he hightailed it out of Congress, along with Senator Chris Dodd, they pushed through a, what can only be understood as a fascist policy of bail-in to really put the United States under the, what's now become known as the Greece model of bail-ins, where to, in the interests of the hedge funds, derivatives, and the monetarist markets, that the uh, bondholders and the depositors of banks would be held accountable for bailing out these institutions. And this is something that we've exposed and have led the fight on, on destroying. Now, this would all become null and void were Glass-Steagall to be pushed through. And as people may be aware, because of our efforts, we've got uh, a bill in the House with 69 co-sponsors and now two bills in the Senate calling for the reinstating of Glass-Steagall, which were this to be done, it would wipe out this policy of bailouts, bail-ins, and put us back in the direction that we were under the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt. Now, it should be understood that what we're doing in Washington and what we're doing around the country is not simply an act of cheerleading. We're not just out there to cheerlead for a bill, but in fact, we're out to lead, and to lead not in terms of just a being against something or just getting behind a single bill, but to really communicate the necessity of the dynamic of Glass-Steagall with the credit system and NAWAPA onto a real robust space program. The idea that we need a positive policy of growth based in a, a rigorous understanding of physical economy, something which Mr. LaRouche has developed you know, to the highest level at this point in history, and which is absolutely necessary to move the planet and the human species into the next phase of evolutionary development. But of course, to do that requires an understanding of real scientific method, an insight into the real nature of the creative processes of the human mind, and how that, in fact, is the only thing which employed can move the human species forward. So today we've got Jason Ross here to discuss a bit about what is the real scientific method, what really is the innate quality of mind necessary to move the human species forward. 
Mm-hmm. When as you're saying, Cody, we've got this live fight right now on Glass-Steagall, and we're seeing already the effects of not implementing it, where life expectancy, child mortality rates are zooming in Greece. They're increasing in a number of counties here in the U.S. to levels sometimes that seem like a third world country. So uh, we're already seeing the decrease. Mr. LaRouche has introduced a concept in economics of potential population density, that based on the technologies you have at your disposal and your political willingness to implement them, how many people can you support at a reasonable standard of living? That value, that level is already dropping below the current population. So the potential number of people on this planet is already below 7 billion. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing as a result of that that the population itself is catching up pretty increasingly rapidly. Now, in this, uh, in a recent paper, Mr. LaRouche wrote on the subject of oligarchy, where you talk about Douglas MacArthur, uh, you say that the real source of evil, the real scourge we have to take on, isn't war itself, but oligarchism, that that is the main evil, uh, the main of the global evils that's threatening mankind right now. And the primary exemplification of that is environmentalism. Now, it's sort of funny because environmentalism is something that some people who believe they want to do good end up getting sucked into. I mean, after all, nobody wants to see, you know, a, a baby seal club to death for no good reason or a whale, you know, harpoon for nothing or, I don't know, I, I filth in the water or some sea animal choking on one of those things that holds a six-pack together. You know, these images that you get. Um, but that's not what environmentalism is actually about. I mean, we shouldn't, you know, have unnecessarily filthy water, and we have had laws that have cleaned things up since the 70s, and, you know, a lot of that was good. You know, we, it's good if the Great Lakes can't catch on fire anymore like they used to. <laughs> so, but what environmentalism does, what's behind it, is an, a, the approach of reducing the world's population from 7 billion down to 1 or below. This comes from the highest levels, from the British monarchy, from the Dutch monarchy, from the largest banking interests in the world. People who are out campaigning for some environmentalist cause might not realize that their main collaborators on this are such friends of the people as J.P. Morgan or Citigroup. But that's who you're hanging out with, Goldman Sachs. Those, Big game those, hunters. Yeah, right. <laughs> those, are, those are your friends. Not only does this kill people, this outlook kill people, but it, it destroys the mind. Because what's at the heart of environmentalism? The idea that there's no distinction that ought to be made between the human species and all other animals. And as, as you cover in this paper, uh, it's, you really have to develop an understanding of the distinction that we are not an animal species, not in any way. I mean, to some degree. I mean, a, a, a living animal is similar to a rock or lava and the fact that it has a mass and things like that, but... Lots of carbon. Yeah, but it's actually alive. So for the human species, what is it that makes us a species? Is it that we're the only species that kills each other? Give me a break. I mean, watch the Nature Channel. Okay, that's not it. We're the only species that changes our relationship to nature. We're the only species that can have a noetic identity. That's what makes us human. So, you know, think about, think about what, what are people... What do people respond to? What's, what's going on emotionally in the population? What are people able to respond to and what are people blindsided by? I mean, one thing that's very good is the response to the NSA spying revelations from the material that Edward Snowden put out. Or people are, despite the efforts of the US media to make this all about him and where he's hiding and if he's facing justice or not, most people think that the bigger deal, correctly, is the fact that the government is completely ignoring the Fourth Amendment, the entire Constitution, and the laws that tell them what to do to spy indiscriminately on everything any American does. Now, this is the Stasi. This is fascism. This is turnkey fascism. This is, you know, Hitler's first targets, among his first targets, were his political opponents. Think of the way J. Edgar Hoover terrorized the country using the FBI to get dirt or create dirt on people to control them politically. Some of the targets of this are the political layers, congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices. What did Senator Wyden know when he asked at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, in the committee meeting, are you targeting Supreme Court justices? Right. Maybe he knows they are. So 
that's good that people are upset about that. You know, people are, are up in arms around the, uh, the verdict on Trayvon Martin, uh, the killing of an unarmed 17-year-old. Yet, many people have neighbors who want to kill most of the people on the planet, and they go over there to hang out and, you know, watch TV with them. It's okay with them. You know, your neighbor might be an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor might want to kill six billion, reduce the world's population by six billion. And somehow that's, that's okay. Your neighbor might believe in appropriate technologies, which is a terrible, disgusting, racist term. As though it's appropriate. It's like, like you're putting poorer countries in a zoo. Like, oh, well, African people, you know, it's like you're talking about what kind of diet you ought to feed to the polar bear in the zoo. Well, the appropriate right. diet is this and that. The appropriate technologies for this sub-Saharan African country are foot-powered water pumps. Hmm. Bullshit. The appropriate technology for any country is nuclear power, water purification systems. I mean, most of the people in these areas have no access to clean water. Almost everybody's got practically constant diarrhea. This kills millions of people. Ever. You know, this is, this is serious stuff. So... You know, and then you take Obama in Africa on his trip, where he not only didn't get to meet Mandela, he also, in a speech to Africans, young Africans, said, sorry guys, but if you all have living standards like the U.S., the planet's going to boil over. So, tough luck. Hmm. He actually said that. That might boil over because he's <laughs> sending us to hell. <laughs> yeah, we might all boil over. So you, you think about the difference between res people responding to what are clearly external pressures on them. You know, people are mad about the, the spying, for example. Yet, they've got their own internal chains, their internal madnesses, their preoccupations that are deliberately implanted in them, and they're unaware of. That right. you can be controlled just as well and actually much more effectively from within than by external pressure. This is the, the whole, you know, British outlook has been especially more recently. That's the better way to control people. Let them put on their own chains, and then they are willing slaves because they're unaware that they're slaves. How many people are unwillingly, without really thinking it through, part of this environmentalist outlook? How many people go to a rally to you know, protest something, and then they're tormented by absolutely terrible music that's maybe about an emotion of anger, but doesn't have an emotion about what kind of future we ought to create? You know? So... Overall, we can't be pragmatic about these things. And we do have to have, in political discussion in the country, a real idea about where we want to go in the future. You know, the credit system. That needs to be discussed. When you're talking with your neighbors about whatever you're talking about, are people discussing credit? People getting together to read Alexander Hamilton's reports to the Congress? You should. Are people getting together to... Look at how FDR implemented the TVA, how the RFC worked. You should. That should be a normal social activity, not watching a stupid show on TV that doesn't matter. That's what our culture needs to be. And a republic depends on having a culture like that. If no one is concerned with where the country is going to go, well, there's definitely some people who have a plan. You know, many of them wear crowns on occasion, you know sashes and all those ridiculous <laughs> things these royal people wear. Powdered wigs. Powdered wigs. Yeah. I mean, they look so silly. Some of these pictures of the queen, it just looks like a little girl playing dress up, you know? <laughs> anyway. But so let, let's take a, I want to take a look at, uh, at a specific concept of, of getting beyond the senses, which is something we've been discussing quite a bit on these shows. I wanted to take up a specific example uh, about physics, about a, a fight between Descartes and Leibniz. And that might sound like it's an old thing. It is. It's centuries old. But it's absolutely relevant today. This is not, these things aren't academic. They're actually patriotic. So let's, uh, let's uh, see if this is getting going here. So, so first off, people, you've probably heard of Rene Descartes. He's a thinker. You've probably heard his quote that he thinks, therefore he is. That might be all you've heard about him. Um, that's, that's sort of, there's really not that much to say about the guy overall. I mean, he got a lot of political support to promote his philosophy, which didn't really consist of anything except for doubting everything. So, I mean, the beginning of his philosophy is, I'm not really sure about anything, but I am sure 
that I am doubting. So the only thing I know exists in the world is my doubt. Well, if he said he wasn't sure about anything in the world, but he does know he wants to eat some lunch, then he could also say, the only thing I'm certain of is that I'm hungry, therefore I am. In other words, his I think, therefore I am, he noticed himself thinking, it was just an observation. He could notice himself being hungry, and it would be an observation. He could notice that his ear itched, and that could be an observation. It's really, anyway, I don't wanna, there's really nothing there. He had a, a big role in laying out the distinction, total distinction between the human mind and the physical world. He said, yes, there's a world out there, and we have minds, but they basically live in two different universes. We're not going to combine them. That comes across in his physical theories, which are so stupid, you can see he must not have applied his mind to them at all. Right. <laughs> so let's, let's take a look at uh, the world according to Descartes. So we've got a video here of how things would occur in the world if Descartes was actually right. Mm. You can imagine what you'd expect would happen now. That's what Descartes' laws of physics say would happen. <laughs> because the cue ball is smaller than the balls, your, the rack balls, it will just bounce right off of them. That's one of his laws of physics. Here's another one. He didn't get out much, I guess, huh? Well, he spent most of his day laying in bed. <laughs> yeah. Here's another one. So you got a car sitting still and a very large truck heading towards it. The truck's bigger. Therefore, when it hits the little car, they both just go together at the same speed. Doesn't happen. Here's another one. Here's a baby carriage, smaller than the car. So, it bounces off, of course. Right. So as he said, yeah, Descartes really didn't get out much. Although when he did get out, it was to uh, kill people or watch other people killing each other. This was, he, you know, he would, he would uh, I forget who it was, he went off to the wars as a mercenary, and since he was rich and paid his own way, he didn't have to fight if he didn't want to. Right. So he could just watch the slaughter, or if, you know, if it looked like a good day and his side was winning, he'd go in and kill a few people if he felt like it. Hmm. This is also where he, had, he got high in one of the army tents and had his dream about melons and the unification of math. Anyway, so what's, obviously what we saw doesn't have anything to do with reality. What's the source of his error? It's that he thought you could understand the world based on how it looks to you. You can't understand the world based on how it appears to you. He didn't get that. Let's take a look at this. Here's a pendulum swinging. Now, studies of falling bodies, you know, since the time of, uh, well, Huygens really figured this one out. You know, bodies that are falling, and you can use a pendulum to get the same kind of change in speed as a falling body. Mm -hmm. The speed at the bottom is as the square root of the height that it fell from. So if you, if you drop a ball from one foot versus you drop a ball from four feet high, it'll take it twice as long to fall four feet as opposed to one foot. And you can actually make a, uh, you can, I saw this really great exp uh, demonstration to show this at a museum. It was a ball that dropped from, I guess, nine feet or maybe 16. And then at nine feet down, I'm sorry, one foot down, four feet down, and then nine feet down, there were bells, and then one at the bottom. And when they let go of the, uh, the ball, it went ding, 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 ding. Mm. You could see at the time was the same between them. Right. Anyway, so we, we've got this, the, the speed at the bottom is the square root of the height, or if a ball is moving, the height it can go is the square of the speed. Now, when you're lifting, this is Leibniz's demonstration that Descartes was wrong. If you're lifting up, you know, weights upstairs, let's say, Leibniz said it takes the same effort to lift 10 pounds one foot as it does to lift one pound 10 feet, which you can get with pulleys. I mean, if you set up pulleys the right way, somebody blindfolded would feel that they're lifting a weight of one pound and they'd pull 10 feet of rope. And if you got the pulleys set up, they could have actually lifted 10 pounds one foot and it would feel exactly the same to them. They're, they're mechanically equivalent in terms of the effort involved, the amount of work you have to do. Something Descartes wasn't really very familiar with, work. Um, so let's take a look at what would happen if Descartes was right. Descartes said that to measure the power of motion, you take how big something is times how fast it's moving. 
That's everything you can observe. How big is it? How quick is it? Multiply them together, boom. You got it. You've got the quantity of motion. So here we've got a large ball at a slow speed and a smaller ball at a larger speed. For each one, the mass times the speed is two. They're rolling along, but when we take into account the heights that balls or objects go based on their speeds, the smaller ball goes to a height of four. The larger ball goes to a height of one. So I lifted one pound four feet, or two pounds one foot. Those are not the same amounts of effort. Right? But, according to Descartes, those motions were equal. They were equal visually, they're not equal in terms of accomplishing anything. Which is part of explains why all of his, everything he said was wrong. So let's take a look at, here's what uh, Leibniz had to say about this. He said, since the height it goes that a ball, that a moving object can go is based on its speed squared, we'll measure its speed squared, not its speed. Mm -hmm. Measure what is it able to do. What could it do in the future? What is it able to accomplish? Not what does it look like, what do we see? Look at what can it do. So Leibniz developed the concept of vis viva, the living force. What's the living force to do something in nature, in physics? And with this concept, he was able to understand how things would interact in a way that wasn't ridiculous, in a way that was actually right, unlike Descartes. So let me just show, let me show one thing here. These are comparisons of different sized balls and objects bouncing into each other. And for each one, I'm going to show what Descartes said would happen and what Leibniz said would happen. And uh, in this case, I think we can go with our senses, because we've seen all these, these kinds of things happen every day, and it's clear who's right. So let's, let's watch that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the silliest one. There was one, that, uh, there was one thing that Descartes got right. That one's not too hard, so let's just watch those again. Right? That doesn't happen. That sure doesn't happen. Nope. And no way. Right? So Every, I mean, everything he said was just so completely off the wall crazy. It's obvious he never checked whether any of it was right or not. So in one sense, you could say he, he understood that the mind wasn't about the senses. But you do need to, at some point, you know, you have to have some sense of whether you're right or not by, you know, doing an experiment, look, making an observation, looking yeah. at the real world. That wasn't something he was interested in. But this general concept of dynamics that... We have to understand the world around us, not in terms of how it appears to us, but in terms of the powers that make things occur. Leibniz demonstrated this with vis viva in the basic world of physics. Mr. LaRouche's economics approach takes this approach to economy as a whole. Don't look at the things in an economy. It's useful to measure the amount of food produced and everything like that, of course, to find out what's happening. But the real the driver in an economy isn't money as a measure for currently existing things, it's the fact that we have economies because we're not animals. We have economies because we discover things about how the universe works around us and then we change how we relate to it. That's the basis of human economics. That's the unseen thing that causes what we then see reflected in our standards of living, our population potentials, and mm -hmm. things like this. And this might seem controversial, given that we're flooded with technologies all around us that seem amazing. People might say, wow, can you imagine going back 10 years with an iPhone? People would have been astounded. Yeah, probably. It's pretty small and it does a lot compared to what we had 10 years ago. But if you want to look for an actual scientific breakthrough, that is, a discovery in science that meant that the way we thought about things in the past was wrong, but you're not going to find that in the past decade. You're not going to find that in the past few decades. 
I mean, if you really have to go back to look for a big one, go back to actually a century ago. Look at Einstein's relativity, Planck's development of the quantum. Those were changes in thought that required a new way of thinking about the entire world around us. An iPhone doesn't do that. If you look at what Vernadsky did in understanding how biology worked, or perhaps Gervich in the biological field, we've had some, but these are still decades old. Mm -hmm. We are not witnessing dramatic revolutions in science right now. And people shouldn't be fooled by technology to think that that's science. If we're going to have a scientific renaissance, we have to be not only freed from you know, the peer review process that prevents new ideas from going forward, but you have to have a basis in thought of how you're going to hypothesize creatively. And I don't want to say much more about that, except that music and culture plays a tremendous role in that. You're a scientist by day, and then you're a you know, who knows what by night. That actually plays a role in things. The kind of music you listen to, what your, what your relationship is to music. Is it just something you listen to? Is it something you engage in? Those are all very important. And possibly most important is having a mission for society as a whole. We got a lot of technological breakthroughs with the moon program. Yeah. If we're going to go and start developing our power for fusion to explore the solar system around us, we're going to have to make actual scientific breakthroughs. And government has a role in driving that and pushing that forward. And uh, well, the space program yeah. gets to the point of, as you were saying before, it did change in a fundamental way man's relationship to the world around him. Now man was a spacefaring being, right? We, it changed a certain sense of identity of what man's relationship to the universe could be, mm -hmm. as opposed to just having more computing power in your, in your iPhone or something like yeah. that, or just having more information to your disposal. And how long ago was that? I mean, this is, it's amazing. Right. This is four decades now. The moon was four decades ago. Who would have thought at that time, oh, that'll be it, and we're not going to go anywhere else afterwards? You know, pretty astonishing. But we are talking about environmentalism before. This is the same, this is the same time period, end of mm -hmm. the 60s into the 70s, that the concept that we shouldn't impose ourselves on nature, that we should live in harmony with nature. I mean, you don't tell, uh, you know, a bunny rabbit to live in harmony with the plant world. You don't say that no animal should exist. Right. That grass is growing. You know, it could grow up to be a nice big grass plant with its flowers and make some seeds. And, but then that rabbit came and ate it. Well, yeah, that's just how it goes. <laughs> you know, there's nothing, there's, no, like, there's nothing that special about grass that we need to worship it as some sort of deity or something. The same with nature. Nature is not some, you know, go capricious god that we have to treat well or else it will destroy us. We don't need to throw virgins in volcanoes or throw nuclear power plants into, you know, wind <laughs> farms or, you know. Right. We're, 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 we're the boss here. We do need to take into account, you know, biology and physical laws, sure. But those don't apply to how we operate as a species as a whole. Those aren't about, we're not going to learn about noesis from watching the behavior of a rabbit. Right. I don't think. Yeah. You know, the difference we're talking about is human beings. The animal kingdom, all the way down, has certain characteristics which seem to be common. They have changes, but essentially the overall behavior is common. Then you come to human beings, and it's no longer common because we have the ability to see the future. Now, there are m many people in the world today, including inside the United States, who have no understanding of this matter. They, don't, they think that everything has to be equivalent to what animals are capable of doing and what human beings are capable of doing. And human beings are not animals. They're animal in the sense that they biologically seem to be animal, but they're a type of animal which is not an animal. It's an animal which is capable of, first of all, foreseeing the future. And no other living process can have a cognitive experience of the future. 
but man can. Now, not only can man do that, but man not only makes discoveries, I mean, you can discover something that everybody else has discovered you know, in the same period of time. Mm. But the point is, you make a discovery where you change the laws of nature, which is called a discovery of principle. It's what we refer to as a discovery of principle. Mm -hmm. Where we revolutionize the way man acts, we change the relationship of, of man to the, to the solar system. It's all these kinds of things are in process. So therefore, the human being is the only truly creative being, that is, willfully creative being. And that's what is lost. Now, for example, from the standpoint of the green policy, the green policy is taking man backwards. Yeah. The green policy is destroying mankind. Now, what happened, we have an evil group called the British Anglo-Dutch Empire. Um, and the Anglo-Dutch Empire is determined to reduce the world's population because the Anglo-Dutch tyranny says it has to be that way. So therefore, we are, we are now engaged, the British monarchy in particular, the Dutch monarchy also in particular, are very specific on this. They are committed to destroying humanity. They are committed presently to take a population level which in your lifetime was 7 billion people and growing. Now you have a collapsing pop human population. Human beings are headed on the road to potential extinction because what's happened is we, we have changed the world and we kept changing it and as long as we kept changing it, things would go better. Yeah. But the minute you stop that and try to reverse it, then you destroy humanity. So we're now headed by the British intention, the Anglo-Dutch intention, is the intention now to bring the human population from 7 billion people rapidly to 1 billion people or less. And that's what the British policy is. That is what the Greeny policy is. If you look at the Green policy and take the, what is called the Green Changes, mm -hmm. the Green Changes mean that mankind is being destroyed. Mankind, it, the ability of mankind to live is reduced constantly at an accelerating rate. Hmm? And the ability of man to exist and the conditions of man's ex existence are getting poorer all the time. So we're going back to not many of the caveman, but other things. We're also facing certain kinds of crises, which are new crises. The, uni the universe is changing always. Right. The solar system is changing always. So, and it's changing in a way that we have to keep up with the change. If we don't keep up with the change, then the human species will be called extinct will be extinctified or whatever the, you want to call that. Yeah. So therefore, what we have now, we have a value in terms of Europe. The European nations in general are all committed to destroying the human species. They may not know that as being their intention, but it's the way they're going. Yeah. And the, the, if you look at the history of life, you take the evolution of, of living forms, Mm -hmm. That has a direction to it, which I think you're rather familiar with. Mm -hmm. All right, if we don't, if we, if the species do not evolve to a higher level of existence, then the species will die. If mankind does not react according to the standard for human beings, then the human species is facing threatened extinction. And who's causing the extinction? Well. The Queen of England is causing the extinction. The, I mean, the Dutch monarchy, which is part of the same thing as the Queen of England, is doing that. So we're being murdered by those who have a green policy. Because you cannot go to the same old same. Right. The existence of all living species has depended upon the, an evolutionary up, up movement. Right. If you try to put the lid on, and then go further and try to return to an earlier page, you're finishing the species. Extinction. Therefore, you have to say that people who believe in environmentalism are in effect clinically insane and dangerously so. Yeah. And that's our problem. Well, and that's actually 
in many ways gets at the definition of insanity. I mean, insanity is whenever you keep doing the same thing over and over again. You know, often they say expecting a different outcome, but even just the idea of getting habituated in any kind of behavior. I mean, this is what Kubi discusses. That's what real neurotic behavior is. Yeah. It's an unwillingness to change and to act on the future. So the idea of denying the future really is the, it's, that is the, the, the seed of neurosis. Mm. When people say, well, we can just go back, or we can just keep doing the same thing, or you get habituated, you're dealing with a neurotic population. And that's largely what we've got now. You could call, you could call uh, reptiles, which went extinct, just exactly right. That. Right. All right. The point is that mankind has now adopted a policy which in the animal kingdoms is called extinction. Right. And mm -hmm. the people who are doing this are people who hate mankind. Right. And but this, look, this is not just limited to that sort of thing. It takes another form. You have people who don't believe in progress. Now, every species that lives can continue to live only by advancing in its qualitative form of existence. Yeah. Hmm? Mankind is the only species which can do that by will. Animals cannot do it by will. Mm -hmm. Mankind, mankind is able to foresee and create the future. Yeah. That's the difference. And what is being destroyed is that when you destroy that ability in mankind, you are causing a great destruction of everything. And this, we we'll say, environmentalism as we know it is inherently a crime. Now, the, we have a middle ground on that. We have some people who are creative. They are becoming less and less a, a percentile of the total population. Mm -hmm. The population is degenerating. So you have people say, I don't know except what I've experienced. Yeah. Right? That, therefore, that's a definition of a mankind which is no longer really human in its characteristic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. therefore, our, our problem is to uh, m let people understand and demonstrate to them what the future means in terms of the continuation of species. And therefore, if we do not pro progress and go to higher orders, I mean, for example, the case of Mars. Now, Mars is a fascinating subject, and it's also sometimes treated very stupidly. But the fact is that mankind has got to actually improve our ability to cope with the solar system and beyond. Mm -hmm. all, all animals have had to do that. Those that didn't succeed in doing that went extinct. Yeah. So therefore, man will go extinct if we don't continue that progress. And that's the problem. You get, how many people on the street will tell you, walking around, well, I don't know anything. I just know what I've experienced. <laughs> I just know what I've experienced. I do not know what I will experience that I have not experienced before. Well, anyone who makes a discovery in physics has done that. He's, he's broken the barrier. Yeah. And, and people who've made other kinds of discoveries, cultural discoveries, which affect the ability of the human mind to, to create, it works. Mm -hmm. But what we have, you, you take the number of people who are actually stupid people, Stupid in the sense that they cannot get beyond their old habits. They just keep doing it. If you tell them that something's going to kill them, you, t you describe exactly what the danger is, they'll shake their head. I only know what I've experienced. Huh. I don't know anything about tomorrow. And people who don't know anything about tomorrow are either killing themselves or they're also killing others, other human beings. And this is the great problem we have now. Mankind is in a process of self-destruction. <clears throat> this president of the United States, for example, is doing nothing but destroy the people of the United States. That's what he's doing. That's the effect of his, his you know, we've had yeah. similar kinds. And the, we've trained people, educated them, to believe in same old, same old. Right. And same old, same old of any species means the extinction of that species unless, under one condition, unless that man intervenes to keep the species in, in operation. 
Mm -hmm. Only when man intervenes to create conditions under which animals can continue to exist. What, what are the animals we have? What animals do we know today? Huh? Let's go for the list of species. Huh? Huh? Mm -hmm. right. How many of these species are still alive? <clears throat> Why are they alive? Mostly, they're alive only because man has intervened to keep the species alive. Mm -hmm. Especially if you project into the future. I mean, there's not, you know, no spe if you look over evolutionary time, very few species that live for you know, more than several hundred million years, or certainly, you know, if you go a little bit longer than that, the, I mean, the only hope any of them have for continuing, the only hope that life has for continuing off this planet is us. Yeah. That's what you said about uh, when you're talking about stupid people. I was just picturing in my mind different types of uh, disabilities that people have and how you overcome them. Like, you know, there's people who got mobility problems or paralysis, and we've got, we've got assistive technologies that make it possible to do most everything yeah. with many problems. You know, sensory difficulties, the case of Helen Keller show is, can be overcome. But there's no technology that's gonna help you overcome stupidity, per se. That's <laughs> not, you know, believe, more computers in the classroom aren't gonna help with that. That has a, I was just picturing that, you know. It's almost like somebody walking around with no arms Somebody walking around unable to make any discoveries or figure out what's going on around them. You're not actually able to be fully, unlike the person with no arms, if you're unable to think, you don't, you're not really functionally human to the extent uh, you could be. If that seems to be the case, if you are only a self-contained individual, if you're a self-contained individual, you are delimited by your own abilities. Mm -hmm. If you are a human being, as in good standing, mm -hmm. <laughs> as a human being, then you are not dependent merely on your own capabilities. You're dependent also upon people who can assist you and make available to you tech technologies which you yourself do not have the power to give. And you do that, one reason, you do it because they're human. And you therefore, you will, the principle is to defend human beings as human beings. Then once you've defended them, now you've got to figure out what you're going to do about it. Yeah. So therefore, usually you find that you have to, <clears throat> as what you do with children, you have to enable the child to accelerate its ability to cope, not just rely on children, advising children, but on the, they become get, gain the power right. to do these things. This is also where the role of culture, art, comes in. That's right. Where so, culture can create a certain mental space, which then the individual mind is now unfolding relative to a, a created mental space, which is of a creative nature. And that way you can mm. actually <laughs> enable and bolster the creative potentials of others. Infrastructure. In your, yeah. And what yeah. you've seen, right. led by the evil people, the Dutch monarchy and the British monarchy, which are the same thing, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not a British Empire. There's an Anglo-Dutch Empire, and the Anglo-Dutch Empire involves, you know, what sixty or seventy percent of the population of the planet. Mm. Yeah. So this, this, we are being destroyed by the British Empire, by its influence in causing this kind of repression. Yeah. Environmentalism is mass is murdering the human species. Because it says you cannot go forward when the, the, the only way the human species can live, yeah. can exist, is by evolving by will into a higher state of existence. Yeah, there is no survival without change. And it has to be, I mean, that's the other thing, is that it's not even simply just progress. It has to be an accelerated rate of that progress. I mean, if you even just look at the evolution of the biosphere, there's not even just a steady rate of evolution, it's a constant increasing rate of evolution. Because with each change necessitates then an even greater rate of change for the next successive step. Well, now you have the great issue is Mars. I mean, this is the one place that people look at out there, and if they're fairly well informed, they wonder, what's on Mars? <laughs> Especially since we began landing some apparatus on that joint. Right which work, uh, and they could, we found that mankind is able to project the product of man's mind by applying it to the t a terrain of Mars without any human beings there. Mm -hmm. We are able at remote control to change Mars. 
and we should probably continue to do that. Yeah. So the point is that what you have is the human mind is something absolutely unique in its noetic capabilities. And that is what we have to understand. The meaning of life, the meaning of human life is that. And if we uh, go against that, we are an extinct species. We are something of the past, something that no longer exists. And if we allow ourselves to be conditioned by forces of government which impose environmentalism <coughs> upon the human species, we are murderers of our own species. Without progress, mankind cannot survive. And mankind does have a mission in the solar system. It's inevitable because the possibility of living under this sun is finite as far as we know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So therefore, <coughs> and mankind does have a destiny in the future. And we have to prepare for it. And these, these silly ideas, which like the slaves of old, were conditioned not to live same old, same old, same old, same old, ever, ever, which always we know is the intrinsic evil against mankind. Green is evil in that way. When we impose it upon mankind, Mankind's job is to always develop itself to a higher order species. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, this species is finished. And those who are pushing environmentalism are obviously criminals, whether they know what they're doing or not. Because what they're doing, the way they're trying to insist on things, they are destroying the human species. They are the enemies of the human species because they break the laws under which mankind is able to exist by the green policy. And it's not done by them as much. They're only the fools do that, the ones who are fooled and make themselves fools. Yep. The fact is it's done by what? We, the problem mankind has had with the human species is what's called oligarchism. That mankind, which is capable of developing self-development as a species, that you had oligarchical systems, like the, you know, the Trojan War was a case of the extinction of a part of the human population, mm -hmm. done by another group which said, we're not going to allow people to have minds. They're going to have obedience to fixed laws. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening to us. That's what the Roman Empire was. That's what the Anglo-Dutch system is. It's a continuation of what's called the oligarchical system. And the oligarchical system is what's destroying mankind. And under our present government, under this president right now, is an embodiment of the oligarchical principle. And if his, if his way of doing things continues, mankind will go extinct. And that's, the, that's what people have to face. Are you willing to buy into your own extinction as a species? Hmm. And well, that's what we're getting. That's what we're living. The Bush family in the presidency, the Obama in the presidency, both represent the threatened extinction of the human species with their policy. Hmm. That's what that's what we're up against. <clears throat> We've lost. We've lost our connection to, met, to humanity when we do that. We allow that to happen. We are traitors to humanity. And that's the problem we have to deal with. Yeah. Well, I think that puts the appropriate challenge on the table. And let us not become the next fossilized set of bones in the museum. But instead, let's move mankind forward and evolve towards our next platform on Mars. So we'll be taking these subjects up more in the coming weeks. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.